Britain enters the airline game, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of heavier than air flight and a tragedy wrapped in a conspiracy. Did a French airship really vanish without a trace? That and more on Old News. It was a cold December in 1903. The wind was frightfully chilly and five witnesses were gathered to see if the Wright brothers would fly or fail. Lucky for us, they flew on the 17th of December and for the first time in history, a machine heavier than air rose from the ground under its own power. December 1923 marked the 20th anniversary of this glorious achievement and organizations around America decided to mark the occasion with their own celebrations. In Dayton, Ohio, the Wright brothers were practically superstars, greeted at the Union Station by an excited crowd of over 1,000 people and dignitaries. The brothers received a message of congratulations from then President Coolidge and were presented with a bronze plaque to commemorate the occasion. Elsewhere in America, 300 people gathered at the Sherman Hotel in Chicago to watch aviation themed movies about the first successful flight. Though, the most spectacular celebration took place in New York when a squadron of Army aeroplanes, commanded by Major William Hensley, flew over New York City, flying three times up and down over the centre of Manhattan Island. The cosy town of Pet in the south of England found itself at the centre of a dire accident on Thursday the 13th. Lawrence Sperry, inventor of the autopilot and the artificial horizon, took off one foggy morning from Croydon, flying in his Sperry M1 Messenger and bound for Amsterdam. The weather improved as he neared the coast, but out over the water, disaster struck. At 12.30, his engine began to splutter. Observers on the ground saw the aircraft circling over Farlight before heading out to sea. Sperry crashed into the water a few miles off the coast. The lifeboat set sail immediately, finding the stricken aircraft floating in the cold waters with only its tail section above the waves. The crew searched for three hours, but found no sign of Mr. Sperry, who appeared to have abandoned the aircraft and swam for safety. He came ashore four weeks later, his body washed onto the beach seven miles east of Pet. Local fishermen attested that he wouldn't have come ashore where he did if he had drowned at the crash site, suggesting he swam quite away trying to reach land. So let me ask you a question. What did Winston Churchill, a Birmingham gun maker, and Southern Railways have to do with British Airways? Throughout the 1920s, France, Germany, and Italy poured subsidies into their airlines, leaving Britain's sorry looking industry in a state of despair. Without the means to compete, Winston Churchill, then the Secretary of State for Air, established the Cross-Channel Subsidies Committee. This offered financial assistance to Britain's ailing airlines. Unfortunately, the scheme failed, and by 1923, the government was roused to action to try and save Britain's airlines. In December 1923, three airlines were operating from the south of England. Instone Airlines was the largest, the youngest was British Marine Navigation, a partnership between Supermarine and Southern Rail, and the most curious one was Daimler Airways, owned by the Birmingham-based gunmaker, the Daimler Company. On the 5th of December, the government reached an agreement to merge all three into one major airline, and finally take on their European rivals. The new airline was named Imperial Airways, and its mission was to connect Great Britain to her network of colonies across the globe. Imperial Airways would grow to become one of the largest airlines in Britain, becoming BOAC in the late 20th century, and then, by the 1970s, becoming our very own British Airways. Everybody was asking the same question. Where did the Dick's Mute go? The airship disappeared on the 18th of December, and it seemed that nobody could pin down its whereabouts. The Dixmude set out for her 1,100 mile journey on Tuesday the 18th, leaving Tulan and setting course for the Algerian oasis of Insala in the heart of the Sahara Desert. 
She reached her destination at 4 p.m. the following day, dropped a single bag of mail and turned north for her homeward journey with a planned stop in the city of Algiers. However, along the way, somewhere south of Biscara, she encountered a strong headwind from the northwest, which blew her off course and out towards the desert. Her commander, Lieutenant Jean Duplessis, fought with the winds, turning south, then north again, eventually finding himself trapped over the Sahara, with the storm building along the coast, soon cutting off his route home. It was on the 20th of December, 60 hours into her flight, that she sent her final message, reporting that she would reel in her radio mast due to a storm. Then she vanished. Days stretched into weeks, and on the 26th of December, the Dixmude was sighted drifting over the Sahara, and at the time, people hoped that the ship and crew would make it home safe and sound. However, that same day, the body of her captain washed ashore on the coast of Sicily. On December the 29th, the French Navy announced that the airship had gone down and all 50 of her crew were lost. So, how did her commander wash ashore if the ship was over Algeria? Well, it turns out, the Dixmude was never sighted over the Sahara. She was instead 500 miles to the east battling thunderstorms over the coast of Sicily. The sightings over the desert were falsified by the French government in an attempt to cover up the loss of the ship. The loss had actually been discovered days earlier. Italian fishermen had reported lightning in the clouds, followed by a flash of fire which sunk below the hills. The ship was the victim of a lightning strike which ignited the hydrogen and sent her plummeting into the sea. It is worth noting, however, there is some disagreement about what brought down the Dick's Mude. While many believe a lightning strike ignited the hydrogen, a report from the American NACA believes that a fuel fire in the engines was a more likely culprit, with burns found on the victims more consistent with that type of fire. A not at all strange conclusion, since the engine manufacturer Maybach had refused to certify the engines for more than 48 hours of continuous use. The Dixmude wasn't made for long journeys, and this may very well have been her downfall. So there you have it. That was the state of aviation in December 1923. If you made it this far, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you want to support the channel. If you missed last month's, you can watch that over here. But that's all from me, and I'll see you in the next one.